Um, it's very exciting to be here. Uh, I'm delighted you will come back from lunch uh, to listen to me. Um, I, I want to follow on from Jonathan actually, actually in a way that I will be talking about um, little about GWAS, but about what comes out of GWAS, genome-wide polygenic scores for educational attainment. And I'll try to place them in a social, environmental, socio-political context. Um, and so I take a slightly different approach in my research to what we've heard so far. Um, we've mainly been thinking about the biological pathways that could help us understand how DNA links with RNA and then translates into proteins and that goes into the brain and eventually we end up with a phenotype um, and in our case in particular complex traits. Um, but I skip over all of that and I go straight to the relationship between inherited DNA differences, so in the DNA, to individual differences in a phenotype or a complex trait and I have one that's my favorite, uh, and that is individual differences in the ability to learn. I'm aware these are not humans, but you'd be surprised how difficult it is to find an image of humans doing a learning interaction. It's not something that's easy to photograph. Now, when I say individual differences in the ability to learn, what I really mean is educational attainment. Um, and we can all argue if school did us good or harmed our creativity and our cognitive development, and I've heard all of this. Um, but for the sake of conducting large genome-wide association studies, it's a really neat thing that most of us can remember the number of years that we went to formal education because we treat that as one of the key outcome variables in these sort of studies. Another might be the highest educational qualification that you've obtained in your lifetime, or on a more fine-grained level of the analysis, the grades or marks that you've actually achieved at a certain level of a degree within an educational program. So these are the three things phenotypically that I'll be focusing on today. Um, and the first law of behavioral genetics is that all traits are heritable and no trait is heritable 100%. Um, and I'm relying heavily here on wonderful work by Danielle, who spoke earlier today, who the, the mammoth task of reviewing 50 years of twin research to put together heritability estimates across studies to get an overall impression of how heritable are human complex traits. And they found about 49% on average is the heritability across the entire phenome. Now, cognitive ability is here, and these are cognitive traits, so cognitive ability, educational attainment, any sort of marker associated with learning, and it comes pretty much in at 50%. So you might want to think it's a good trait, a good phenotype, to try and identify some genes that actually account for that heritability. And this is what we do in the genome-wide association studies, and we've seen this plenty of times before today, so I'll be very brief on this. But this is taken from Okbe et al. in 2016, who had a sample of 290,000, 94,000 participants on years spent in education. That was the phenotypic variable. And they also had genotype data. And what they could then do is match the, gen the genomic differences between people in SNPs to their phenotypic differences. And what you see here is the famous Manhattan plot with the p-values. There were 74 significant loci that were identified in that study, and each of them accounted for a very small effect size. And this is common to all GVAS, um, and the same goes for the ones that are not genome-wide significant. Each of them accounts for a tiny, tiny proportion of the variance. So one thing that you might want to do with such an analysis and the results is to go and seek out these individual genes and try to find out what they do and how they function in terms of our biology. And that's what we've heard about today. Uh, another approach might be to ignore the fact that something here is significant across the genome or not and to wonder about the specific pathways and say, well, if we have all these genetic variants that are associated with the phenotype of our interest, with these tiny effect sizes, maybe if we bunch them all together, we can try and predict something about individual differences and explain behavior. And that's exactly what a genome-wide polygenic score does. So this is an example of how you would get to one. Imagine you have a bunch of people, and for each of them you have their SNPs, 
and you code them according to allele frequency with the increasing allele. So every person gets a score of 0, 1, or 2. And then you multiply that by the association that this SNP had in the genome-wide uh, genome -wide association study in the discovery sample, and you add them all together to a genome-wide polygenic score. So bear in mind, you do all this in an independent sample. This is, you do not need to do that in the sample where you made the genome-wide association discoveries in the first instance, but you can do that in any sample where you have genotype data. And if you do that in a large sample of British individuals, which I'm happy to have the opportunity to, um, this is based on about 6,000 16-year-olds, you get an almost perfectly normally distributed genome-wide polygenic score for educational attainment. And this is very similar to the distribution of their GCSE scores, and GCSEs is a nationwide compulsory exam that British children take at the age of 16, because that's sort of the end of formal education. You can go on, but you don't have to. Uh, so that is a pretty good marker of, of cognitive ability in the country. Um, the next question is, what do these genome-wide polygenic scores actually predict in terms of phenotypic differences? And the answer is, it depends very much on the size of the genome-wide association study or the discovery sample that we used. So this is plotted um, six different GWAS and genome-wide polygenic scores based on different GWAS analysis. And you have at the bottom the sample size increasing with one million at the end here. And you have the percentage of variance explained here in the phenotypic observation. And as you can see, the first, one of the first genome-wide polygenic scores for IQ or cognitive ability accounted for about 1% of the variance based on samples of 50,000 and fewer individuals. The second one, 78,000 individuals came in at um, three, uh, just 3% of the variance. And then from then, we are going up. Last week, a new paper came out from the Ian Deary group that showed 6% of the variance accounted for with a new GWAS analysis um, combining uh, UK biobank data and other cohorts. For educational attainment, we account for just about 2% of the variance with the latest published genome-wide association study, um, 294,000 people. The new one isn't yet out fully, but I hear it's in the making, which will have, as Jonathan said, 1.2 million people, and is thought to explain more than 10% of the variance in educational attainment. Now, I want to spend the rest of my time giving you some examples of how I think we can use these genome-wide polygenic scores to understand genetic influences on behavior in the context of our day-to-day -day environments. So one of the first things that we did was to try and work out if a genome-wide polygenic score based on a GWAS for years of education has any predictive validity for cognitive data from children and adolescents. And we did that in TETS, which is a very large twin study. This is based on 3,000, although not 3,000 twins, but 3,000 unrelated individuals here. And what you see is the mean standardized scores for educational attainment. So this is basically their overall school grades for the year. And the genome-wide polygenic score is split into septiles. And as we go up in age, we account for more and more of the variance, with 3% of the variance explained at age 7, 5% at age 12, and 9% at age 16. Um, and you may say, well, we kind of would have guessed this from a GWAS for years in education, but in fact, nobody has shown this before. And it's quite amazing to think that you can take summary statistics from a GWAS analysis in an adult sample for something as crude and non-normally distributed as years of education and match it on to school grades in 16-year-olds. The other thing that I hear a lot is that 9% of the variance isn't much because um, <clears throat> it leaves 91% of the variants unexplained, and that is a fair point. But uh, as we are in the life sciences, 9% of the variance, a correlation of 0.3, is a pretty normal effect size, pretty stable effect size. And I would like to point out it translates into real differences. If you look at these septiles and who goes on to university and who doesn't, 65% in the top per septile for the genome-wide polygenic score will go to university compared to 37% in the lowest septile. So that is, that is a clear translation of a genetic effect on educational choices, which is exactly where we went next, looking at educational choices. Families are very different. And 
people's educational choices allegedly vary as a function of their family background. I'm saying allegedly, but we very well know that children from families whose parents have been to university have a much higher chance to go to university themselves, and vice versa, children who come from families where neither parent uh, went to higher education have a reduced chance of going into higher education. The question is, what are the mechanisms that underlie this? Is it that university-educated parents provide a sort of different environment for their children that makes them blossom, that makes them learn better, and therefore prepares them to go on to university? Or is it possible that there's a genetic element to this? And this is exactly what we tested using genome-wide polygenic scores. So here you see plotted the average um, per group, the average of the genome-wide polygenic scores for years spent in education across four different educational groups. Stably educated are children who are going to university and who had at least one parent who also went to university. Stably uneducated are children whose parents have not been to university and who don't go themselves. And what you can see very clearly is that the stably educated ones have the highest average genome-wide polygenic score and the stably uneducated, the lowest on average. So there is a genetic element to who goes to university and who doesn't, that is besides the family background. Now really interesting are the two in the middle. Because you have downwardly mobile children who do not go to university even though their parents went, upwardly mobile children who go to university even though their parents did not. And ultimately this goes to show that some people especially for the downwardly mobile ones, uh, upwardly mobile ones, they overcome some of the disadvantages associated with their family background, partly for genetic reasons. And I think that's an important um, notion to realize, perhaps a controversial one too, um, that genetics are implied in educational choices and not only um, factors that refer back to environmental provision. I have another example on that, staying with Britain in schools, because um, that's, that's kind of a really hot, hot topic. Um, we have three types of schools in England, um, and parents are well advised to worry about the type of school their child will go to before the child is actually conceived. The first type of school is state schools. They're non-selective, and uh, you go according to catchment area, i.e. the geographical region that you live in um, around the school. The second type are selective state schools. You pay no fees, but admission is regulated by cognitive ability, so you need to pass a certain IQ test in order to make it in. The third type is the so-called public schools. This is again an English thing. They call things that are particularly expensive as if they were particularly cheap and the other way around. So these are private schools that come with a hefty price tag of about $45,000 a year, and they do cognitive testing, and they do a lengthy interview process. So it's, it's really a test if you're clubbable to get in there. This, in case anyone was wondering, is actually from Eton, the, one of the most famous private schools in England. And until the 60s, they did have to wear a top hat when they went. Here is uh, what you see in terms of genome-wide polygenic scores in relation to schools. So you have state non-selective schools the, where the average genome-wide polygenic score comes in close to zero, it's a little bit negative even. Uh, you have the selective grammar schools, so these are the ones that select according to cognitive ability test scores, and then the private selective schools, and you can see the average genome-wide polygenic score is much higher in those two. What you should also see very clearly is that there's a difference in achievement in the final year exam, so again, this is age 16 at the end of compulsory schooling, GCSE examination according to school. I apologize, we flipped over the colors here. This is a small, um, just checking that everybody's still here. But the order of the schools is the same. So the light, light gray bar is the state non-selective schools, turquoise is the grammar schools, and the darkest bar is the um, private selected schools. And you can see that those schools that select significantly, also the children score much higher on average on GCSEs. Right, so far so good, but the question is, is it because of the school? Did these expensive private schools and the very nice selective state schools, do they do something different with the kids that makes them perform so much better when it comes to age 16 exams? And I have to say, these are really important 
because they drive the decision if you go on to A-levels, and A-levels is your key into university. So it's, it's not an arbitrary exam that you just sit at some point. It has lifelong implications for what you're going to do next in terms of educational choices. This is what happens once we control for the selection criteria that these schools use to admit students. The difference in scores disappears and becomes non-significant. So this is for every parent considering sending their children to private education. It's not really worth it. They take in the best, and of course the best come out at the end, but it's not the school provision that makes the massive difference. Um, I have one more example about thinking um, about the influence of genome-wide polygenic scores and educational attainment in the context of specific environmental differences, not school types, but here uh, we are using a large sociopolitical change as they happen every now and then in history, and we call them quasi-natural experiments. And the one that I mean here in particular is uh, the end of the Soviet Union, or the Soviet era compared to the post-Soviet era. And this is, um, this is taken in Estonia, and it's a, it's a picture of the Baltic chain, um, which was a peaceful demonstration uh, actually in 1989, so two years before the official end. Um, and we are working with a group from Estonia here, a large biobank that um, has, eventually will have 52,000 people with uh, genotype data, but these analyses are based on a subsample of 12,000 individuals. And what we did was we wondered if we should see differences in the association between genome-wide polygenic scores and educational attainment and occupational success in the Soviet era compared to the post-Soviet era, because we would assume that some things in the environment have changed in the post-Soviet era. In particular, the post-Soviet era is more likely to have adhered to democratic, uh, to meritocratic principles in the allocation of education opportunities. In other words, post-Soviet uh, children who went to school in, in the post-Soviet era would have made their educational choices much more in line with their cognitive abilities than it was the case during the Soviet era, where you might want to say in a very generalistic, polemic way that admission to university was a function of party membership rather than of actual ability. And we have the opportunity in the sample to try this because uh, the vast majority was born um, before 1981. And so we would assume that people who were aged 10 or more at the time when the Soviet Union ended made the majority of their educational choices in a time that was influenced by the Soviet era politics, whereas those younger than 10 um, when, when the Soviet um, Union ended, would have made their choices in this very different world. And this is exactly what we see. Here we use the genome-wide polygenic scores for years spent in education to predict EA, educational attainment, so the highest educational qualification that somebody has attained, and occupational status. And S stands for Soviet era, PS is post-Soviet era. So the red bars, signify the strength of association between the genome-wide polygenic scores for years spent in education and educational attainment and occupational status during the Soviet era. Um, the light blue bars are what happens in the post-Soviet era. And what you can see is that the predictive validity goes up to 6% compared to 2% in the Soviet era. Now, this would be an example for a significant gene-environment interaction. These are very difficult to track. We, we try a lot um, because ultimately um, in individual differences research we are convinced that it is the gene environment interplay that will finally help us to understand why people are so different in their development. But in many cases, environment and genetic predisposition are correlated and that makes it difficult to detect interactions, whereas here with this massive change for an entire population, you don't have the correlation problem. However, the reason for the change is a complete interpretation of mine and highly speculative. I cannot prove what changed in the environment from the Soviet era to the post-Soviet era that led to the increase in heritability. It could be thousands of different things. And in particular, this sort of analysis makes it impossible to detect a specific environmental element. 
which is why I think we should think about studying the environment in order to advance the understanding of genetics for complex traits. Because if you think about how much we know about genetics and DNA, it's an awful lot compared to the environment. We know how DNA translates into RNA and how that codes for proteins, but we don't know that for a single environmental variable or experience. We also, we, we know SNPs and we think of them as a unit or a small, um, yeah, a small unit of, of variants, um, perhaps a small unit of DNA variants, but we don't know the smallest unit of the environment to match it against, which kind of makes it difficult to study gene-environment interactions. So in my lab, we use a bunch of new uh, technologies that help us getting a better idea about the environment that surrounds people. In particular, we are interested in early life development and the sort of environments that children are exposed to. And so, for example, we use um, digital language recorders that record everything that a child has heard in a six foot radius over the course of a day. And you may want to take to, this, the, uh, to these data the same a theoretical approach as we do to GWAS and just chuck it all together in analysis and see if you get significant hits for a specific word that is associated with children's own verbal development or their cognitive abilities. Another thing that we use, that was also mentioned before, uh, smartphones to do experience sampling. Um, in particular, we thought this might be useful to study uh, dietary patterns, which we know from psychological studies are meant to be associated with well-being, uh, mental health, and children's development, but it's been always very difficult to track them exactly in their precise way as they're happening. And that is pretty much all that I had to say on this. Um, I'm hoping I've made two things clear, if nothing else. One, genome-wide polygenic scores are really useful predictors already for behavior but they will become even more important for understanding the genetics of complex traits when they help us to disentangle the gene environment interplay. Thank you very much. We have time for questions uh, right there. Have you looked at uh, the, the data in the context of adoption? Um, uh, yes, although not these data in particular, but yes, adoption studies have been used widely to try and mainly to understand um, heritability as an alternative design to twin studies. And the results are pretty much the same, um, at least for cognitive ability, for other traits, not so much. We have a question in back in the middle. Microphone's getting to you now. <laughs> there you go. When you're tracking these genes, are, uh, some are methylated uh, at particular periods of time or particular uh, environmental factors or whatever. Uh, how do you track that or is that a consideration in terms of your analysis? Um, it, we don't track that, and it's not a consideration in our analysis uh, because we're not really looking at gene expression, but we're looking at inherited DNA differences, and those are not affected by these factors. We have a question down here in front. And there's... I would have predicted that the in the school sample that the upwardly mobile cohort would be the one that would show most clearly the influence of genetic traits and yet that isn't the case in fact they were less influenced than the downwardly mobile can you comment on any of that well um uh, it's true, um, I, I have heard this before, that um, the effect sizes are actually smaller than expected. At the same time, for starters, I think the genome-wide polygenic scores that we have so far do not capture all of the variants, so that picture is going to change, I think, as we get bigger and more reliable GWAS and therefore get better scores. Um, on the other hand, of course, educational choices are not only a matter of genetics. 
So it makes a good sense to see a shared environmental effect or a family effect here um, that may account even for a greater amount of variance at this point. However, the finding that some children will go to university because of their genetic propensities um, is, is still um, the one that stands out in these analysis, I think. We have another question in the back. Just a, a comment on that previous question and answer. So in, in my talk this afternoon, I will show a slide from a, the Dunedin study, longitudinal study in New Zealand, which does actually show within an SES bracket, upward mobility is positively correlated with superior PGS and downward mobility is uh, correlated with below average PGS. So the effect that one expects is actually seen in that data set. Mm -hmm. Which I would expect is very similar to that, just that it wasn't expressed in a correlation. But it's essentially, if you correlate it, you will come to the same result if you treat the, the education categories by family as a, as a continuous variable, or you code them into up and down. Yes. Uh, one other question. So uh, school is t typically considered what they call the shared environment, right? People either have genetic influence, shared environment, non-shared environment, things that happen to individuals. And I wonder if you look at things in school that would be non-shared, like individual teacher-student relationships or experiences at school that are customized or not shared. Mm. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. So the, the diction shared, non-shared environment um, comes from the twin literature with the idea that twins grow up in the same environment, hence shared environment, they also have common genes, and um, they also have unique environmental experiences, so non-shared environments. Um, we, we do look at um, non-shared environmental experiences, also they're very difficult normally to do in twin data because the twins tend to go to the same schools. In fact, they tend to go to the same teachers, like they're in the same classes. So it's difficult to find um, effects there. That said, whenever we've done studies looking at differences in the school t context between twins, we don't find very strong effects. One of the reasons might be that um, unique environmental experiences um, are not necessarily related to actual events or experiences, but it's something in the twins' perception that is, has nothing to do with what has actually occurred. So in fact, if you asked um, siblings, twins, including um, to report on their family home, how things were, you would sometimes think they were, grew up in different families because it's so different what they tell, what they think they have experienced. Um, and that is one of the problems of trying to look at non-shared environment. We've just done a study looking at monozygotic twins who are, uh, well, just monozygotic twins, and we looked at their discordance and educational achievement, which is very small because monozygotic twins are so similar, highly correlated in educational achievement, and so the distance is in, in school grades is very, very small. But we did wonder if that relates to something systematic in their environments, and we found no non-shared environmental factors that influenced it. But what we could see was that the difference in school achievement corresponded to the twins' differences in all other traits. So twins who had a greater distance in school achievement were also more different in conscientiousness and in intelligence and in all other traits that sort of feed into being successful at school, which made us think that non-shared environments perhaps operate in a similar way to genetic variants in the way that they have a, a general effect on the phenome, not just specific. It's not trait and age specific. But these are very early days, and it's, it's not really out yet. So. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.